talk a lot about energy generation, but of course, no one's actually generating energy, creating it. The energy is all around us. It's in the sunlight, it's in the wind, it's stored up in fuels. And what we need to do is borrow it from our surroundings in the most sustainable and efficient way. And it's a huge challenge which requires some huge technology, which is why I'm here standing on top of the Haliad X, which is one of the biggest wind turbines in the world. It's a step on the way to some even bigger offshore wind generation projects. But what is it that's so special about this turbine? Are these things just gonna keep getting bigger and bigger? How big do they need to get? And how much of a difference can offshore wind really make to our electricity needs? We're about to find out. Welcome to Fully Charged. Amsterdam, San Diego, Sydney, the number one festival for clean energy and electric vehicles is coming to you. Whether it's Fully Charged Live in Europe, supported by Mobility Service, or Fully Charged Live UK, supported by LV, we cannot wait to see you there. Generating energy from the wind is really big business. Wind energy accounts for 5% of global electricity production now, and that fraction is increasing all the time. But to really scale it up, you need windy places with loads of space, preferably away from people and things like aircraft. So in order to find all those things, there is a huge amount of effort going into putting wind offshore in the shallow coastal seas where people don't live. And so this wind turbine here is an onshore prototype for an offshore wind farm. And it is hard to emphasize just how massive it really is. So the most impressive statistics about this turbine is it's a 14 megawatt offshore direct drive. The blade, uh, the rotor diameter on the machine is 220 meters in diameter. That's uh, about two and a half times the size of Big Ben up to the tip. So 260 meters to the very top of the turbine. Um, it's, it's almost reaching the height of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, each blade is bigger than a jumbo jet and uh, it produces enough, this one turbine will produce enough energy per year to power tens of thousands of homes. It is really hard to get the scale of wind turbines into your head, but I've got some scale models to help. Now, what matters is the swept area of the wind turbine, so the circle that it sweeps out. So on a scale of about one centimetre to 10 metres, this is about the scale of the first commercial wind turbine in the UK, Delabole Farm, 1991, uh, 400 kilowatts was what that is. So that's down there. And then we go up in size, you get, you get smaller ones in the UK with rotor diameters of about 52 meters. But the one you see most often in the UK now, if you're driving on along roads, you'll see two megawatt turbines and they have a rotor diameter of about 90 meters. So that's our orange, but they are still getting bigger. And onshore in the UK today, the biggest ones you'll see are about six megawatts. So they have a rotor diameter, and this is getting big, of 150 meters. So that's the melon. And then we have Haliad X out here behind me with a rotor diameter of 220 meters. And on our fruit scale here, that is the size of a watermelon. So there's this really dramatic increase in size and the wind turbine out here really is huge.
So in order to bring the cost of energy down, in order to generate more electricity for our customers, you need to go bigger. And bigger is difficult to do. Uh, it's taken us many, many years to grow the turbines to this size. And it's not just about the technology in the turbine itself, but there's a whole bunch of work goes into manufacturing, you know, constructability. The whole industry is now moving to bigger vessels to be able to install them. So there's a lot, a lot of steps that have gone into building this. So uh, the offshore wind industry started in earnest about 15 years ago, and it's just been scaling ever since. Why do they need to be this big? Are they going to get bigger? They will get bigger, and uh, I don't know what the theoretical limit is, but uh, as the technology improves, they're going to keep getting bigger. And it just comes down to the fact that the swept area gives you the amount of energy capture. So you're trying to capture as much wind flow as you can, and that turns into energy. So the bigger the rotor, the better. So the bigger the rotor, the higher you have to go, A, so that you don't hit the sea, but also because as you go up, you get a thing called the shear effect, and the wind speed actually goes higher um, as you, the, the wind speed is faster as you go higher up, um, and the energy goes by the cube of the wind speed, so small changes in the wind speed turns into a lot of energy. So you actually want to go as tall and as big as possible, uh, and so we're constantly racing that battle, and the industry is constantly growing and trying to uh, move us in that direction. of the really cool technology that's inside the turbine because GE thought some of it was a bit too commercially sensitive. We are almost at the top. I couldn't show you much of what we passed on the way up, but this is where it is about to get exciting. So here we go. Look at this on top of the world up here. We are a long way up. <laughs> it, is, it is really hard to emphasize just how big this is, but as well as being big, it also looks sort of slender. It's almost fragile. There's a lot of strength in this and the blades are these huge sweeping curves. Like it's not just fascinating engineering. It really is beautiful to look at. And I didn't, I didn't think that would be my first reaction coming up here. And we are a long way up. That's the other thing, is that you can really feel this is where the wind is. The further off the ground you get, the further away you get from the friction at ground level, the stronger and the steadier the wind blows. And you can really feel that up here. It is just a beautiful place to be on top of a wind turbine. Doesn't get any better than this. The point of a wind turbine is to take kinetic energy from the wind and turn it into electrical energy. And the, the way you generate electrical energy is you use a principle discovered by Michael Faraday a long time ago, which is that if you move a magnet relative to a metal wire, you induce a voltage in the wire. And if you do that hard enough, you generate a current, and that's what goes into the grid. So the game here is that you want to move magnets relative to coils of wire. So that's what this axle through the middle of the top of a wind turbine does. That's where the turning happens. And on the back of the uh, so the back, back side of the turbine here, where the nacelle is, that's where the electricity generation is all happening. So there's magnets in there. There's, that's where energy generation is happening. Um, so that turns rotational movement into electrical energy. So then you've got to get your rotational movement. And that's obviously done out the front here with the blades, which are pushed by the wind. And the wind will always be um, perpendicular. The whole wind turbine can turn. So it's always facing into the wind. So the wind pushes on the blades, pushes them around. And that's where your energy comes from to gener generate electricity. 
it's not just electricity generation that's in the top here. There is also really, there are also really sophisticated control systems, and they're doing a few different things. The first thing is that they're controlled in the direction of the wind turbine, that's very important. Um, the next thing is that the, the blades can change their angle independently. All of them can do this separately, and that's known as pitching. And the reason for doing that is that the wind is pushing on the shape of the blade that it first arrives at from the direction it first arrives at. And if you tilt the blade, you alter the amount of wind push on that blade. And that's very useful if you've got wind speeds that are varying very quickly, or if you've got gusty winds. So that's how a wind turbine works together. The blades push on an axle, the control systems and the electricity generation inside the nacelle generate the electricity you want. And then that goes down here and out into the grid and the rest of the world. One rotation of the blades, let's start small, one rotation of the blades can power a house for two days. Just one turn. Okay. Okay. So then you scale it up and, and then you start looking at how much power to provide every year and it can provide enough power for thousands of homes over a year. Um, and then when you scale up to the wind farm size, something like Dogger Bank is going to provide about 5% of, of the energy in the UK grid. Offshore wind, like how much, how much bigger can this get? How much more of it can we use? Well, the, the government in the UK has announced recently they're targeting to install 40 gigawatts of offshore um, by, I think, by 2030 or 2050. So that's more than we use as that's, a country? That's, yeah, that's almost to converting the entire electrical system into offshore wind. We are quite clearly in a port, which is not normally where you'd expect to be discussing wind turbines. But there's a reason it's here. This is a prototype, the one that they use to license it, to test it out, to work out all the problems. And it's the first of many, because very soon there will be hundreds of these at a big project in the North Sea. So Dogger Bank, just for the get, to get the bit of geography out of the way, so off the east coast of Britain there is um, a shallow area of sea which kind of was a hill and then the sea level rose and it's now submerged but it's, it's kind of a nice shallow bit yep. compared to the, most of the coastal ocean. So the plan is that there is going to be a wind farm there which will have how many of, of these turbines? So 277 of the turbines and they're spread over each plot is about five to 600 square kilometers. So in total for the three phases that we're building, you've got a land area about the size of Greater London. A nuclear power station in the UK might produce what, two to three gigawatts? Yeah. So, so about the same as the Dogger Bank yeah. installation will do. Yes. And when will the Dogger Bank thing, the, the, that farm start producing? So we're going to start installation in 2023 and it's going to run through to 2026 for the three phases. So it's separated into three separate phases. If we decided, if yeah. the world decided, just to build lots of wind turbines. Are there other bottlenecks? Is there anything that slows the process down or can everyone just go? So, well, first you've got to start with the development and the permitting. So that takes a long time in most countries. Uh, I, mean, I think the first conversations that started happening and the lease areas were awarded in 2008 for Dogger Bank. So there's it's been a very, a long pretty time. long time. And that's just, you know, for the companies to go out there, assess the sizing, do all the environmental studies, figure out the financial viability and bring it all together. Um, so that, that takes quite a long time to, to, to develop the site. Then once it's developed, you've got to build it and execute it. And, and you know, it's, it takes, it's not such an easy feat to design and build something of this size. So then there's manufacturing uh, challenges that are going to be overcome, but they will be overcome. Then you're probably going to run into a limitation on the right um, seabed. So right now, most of the turbines going in a fixed bottom. So that means so they're, they're actually connected drilled to the into seabed. the bottom. Yeah. Yeah. So these ones will be going onto monopiles that go into the sea floor. Um, that restricts where you can deploy offshore in many places of the world. So anywhere you've got a continental shelf, like the west coast of the US, you know, Norway, off the coast of Morocco, they've got great wind conditions, but they, they're too deep. So right now, most of the projects are fixed bottom projects. Um, what will happen? probably by the end of the decade is we'll start to see floating offshore wind and then that will unlock a much broader geographical area to deploy offshore. So how does this mix in with the different energy? Because however good it is, no one energy source is going to deal with all the problems. So how does this kind of offshore wind fit in with everything else we need? So 
we will have a mix in the end. There's not going to be one technology to rule them all. Um, you're going to have a mix and it's going to be really determined by the resource that you have there. So luckily in the UK, we have amazing wind resources. And so I say wind is going to become one of the dominant players in, in the UK. Um, I believe that offshore is going to start playing a bigger and bigger part simply because there's land constraints and if you wanted to replace a you know two gigawatt nuclear power station and or a big coal fire power station you couldn't deploy this onshore so if you want to do onshore wind you wouldn't be able to find a, a sp you know a space the size of greater london and put turbines all over it because people live there or you're using it for other purposes and the same thing with solar solar takes a relatively large amount of land so um, i believe if you want to deploy at scale it's going to be uh, winds but then obviously you can have a mix you'll have storage you'll have hydro you'll have all of the other technologies in the background um, the trick is to have a mix of all the different generating technologies and interconnection to other countries so you know as a weather front passes across you'll have the wind blowing and then it'll move somewhere else and then you'll interconnect The thing that really struck me about today was that I think for the first time I understood, like really understood in my head, the scale of the UK's energy challenge. Because this is a massive wind turbine, but the idea that 300 of those could provide 5% of the UK's electricity needs, that's kind of, you know, those are scalings I understand. I can almost, I can feel what that is. And the other thing about that that I find very optimistic is that if you can make technological solutions this big, this feels like a solvable challenge. We can do this. We can generate this electricity. And that, that is such, it's a, it's a relief in a way to feel it viscerally. And it doesn't mean that there isn't a long way to go because there is. We need plenty more technology and adaptation and we need to keep pushing, but we can do this. There are things like this coming down the line which will change the way we generate our electricity so it causes, just gets rid of the fossil fuels. And, and that's what we all want to see. So it's been great to see, it's been great to see the technology. It's been great to go up the top and feel what it's like in the wind up there where all the energy is, where a lot of energy is. Um, and so yes, thumbs up all around. I hope this kind of thing continues. It's been really exciting to see it. And so that's it for this episode. If you like what we do, have a look at the podcast, have a look at the website, fullycharged.show. Um, subscribe to the channel, support us on Patreon if you can. And if you have been, thank you for watching. Well, I think that was an amazing episode. I'm so grateful to Helen. She is an incredible scientist, brilliant presenter. We really appreciate having her on the channel. Here's another episode she did a while back. Here is our latest episode that's just come out up there. You can subscribe to Fully Charged. That really helps us, cost you nothing. And up here is the link to our Patreon page. All support gratefully appreciated. Thank you.